Wright sat up smoking in his study late into the night. On the other side of his huge antique desk, Jason and his assistant Darren sat in tense silence. Darren kept his head down, watching his hands as they twisted anxiously in his lap. Jason stared blankly into space. Henry was so mad at his grandson that he was tempted to throw a paperweight at his head. Instead, he snapped. Why does it have to be that woman you've set your heart on? No one is worth all of this, especially not Madison. She's got her heart fixed on Ian and she'll never give you the time of day. She's making you look like a fool in front of everyone. Jason swallowed. What am I supposed to say? I know I look a fool. There's no way to spin it for the media this time, he thought. He had been rejected and caught out telling lies. He rubbed his forehead, feeling a headache coming on. Why can't she love me? I'm more devoted to her than Ian is. I'm willing to give her and her unborn child everything, but she still doesn't want me. Will I only have a chance with her once Ian's dead? He shook his head, laughing at himself humorlessly. He was turning into a person he didn't even recognize. Henry watched with narrowed eyes as expressions chased each other across Jason's face. How can he possibly still love a woman who's rejected him so many times? Eventually, her refusals will wear away his feelings for her. Especially since she's so unattainable. She's married and a mother. Surely he can see it's hopeless. She's rejected him privately and in public. Women are queuing up for his attention and he wants the only one he can't have. His mouth twitched as understanding bloomed. Maybe that's the root of the problem. He only wants her because she's unavailable. Henry stood up decisively and gave Jason a meaningful look. Now I finally understand what you need. You don't need to get involved anymore, just leave everything to me, and I'll send Madison running to you. He left the study with Darren scurrying behind. Jason watched them leave with worried eyes. What does he mean he'll get me what I need? I don't even dare think about what the old goat means, he thought. Henry strolled through the house. We'll throw all our support behind Liana, he told Darren. Are you writing this down? Good. We'll use Liana's lawsuit against her to make sure Madison goes to prison. Then, when she's no longer under the Weston's eye, we'll be able to deal with her. Javier is useless now, so we don't need to waste any more time on him. He chewed on his lip for a moment, then declared, We don't need to hide any of these plans from Jason. Let's see what he's made of. Yes, sir, Darren replied respectfully, although he blanched at the thought of what lay ahead. What will it look like when the Westons openly clash with the Wrights? It seems like a war is about to begin. He was right. The very next morning, the city awoke to the news that Jason had proposed to a pregnant married woman. Gossip exploded everywhere. This was the juiciest tale to pour out of the rumor mill in a long time. What sort of trump card were the rights holding to make Jason think he could get away with that? So many stories were going around that it was hard to tell what was fact and what was fiction. Ian Weston was mentally ill. He had been rushed into the hospital. He was dead. He was alive. He had divorced Madison, but was that because she was carrying Jason's child? Which of those men did Madison love? She had previously stated that she would stand by Ian's side. But had that been false news? With the whole city buzzing with gossip about the love triangle, it was inevitable that attention would turn to the animosity between the Westons and the Wrights. That antagonism was soon more than just rumors. As soon as the working day began, Edward called a company meeting and ordered that all business ties with the Wrights be cut. That included removing from sale any items shipped by A1 Logistics, the biggest shipping company in the region. In all the shops and malls managed by the Weston family, goods were stripped off the shelves until hardly anything remained. Retail chaos ensued. In retaliation, Henry Wright ordered that all contracts with Weston managed firms be broken. Anyone even vaguely connected to the Westons was sacked. The family feud threatened to bring the local economy to its knees. Things only escalated from there. Edward ordered all the subsidiaries of the Weston Group to cut ties with A1 Logistics. Daniel and Cassandra's companies joined the boycott, 
which soon spread to all the businesses that had good relations with the Weston Group, such as those run by the Quinn and Gold families. The Westons were a large family with deep roots in the city and were well respected by the whole business community. When they called, people listened. Within half a day, the Wright family was isolated, like a cornered king on a chessboard waiting for the final checkmate. Even a major company like A1 Logistics was threatened by such a boycott. In his office, Henry Wright swept his arm across his desk, sending everything on it crashing to the floor. This is all Edward's doing, he yelled, trembling with rage. That traitor. He said he put business before personal considerations, the liar. Darren kept his mouth shut and waited out his boss's anger. What did he expect? I never realized how naive Henry could be. He almost caused Ian's death and tried to steal his daughter-in-law. And now he expects Edward to show him professional courtesy. That's just crazy. All it proves is that Henry has no conscience, he thought. We'll hold a press conference immediately, Henry barked. See to it. We'll see what the Westons have to say about that. Darren's phone rang, and when he answered, his whole face fell. Um, Mr. Wright, the Weston Group has just announced that they're holding a press conference. Growing in frustration, Henry turned on the TV. The press conference was just about to start. Edward and Daniel were standing at the podium with representatives from all the major media outlets clustered around them. The two men stood tall and radiated sophistication, seeming not to be aware of the flashbulbs constantly going off in their faces. When Edward stepped up to the microphone to begin speaking, the reporters hushed instantly to hear him. Thank you all so much for attending this conference at such short notice, he said. I'm sure you're all aware of the recent conflict between our company and A1 Logistics. We're here to explain the matter. He looked directly into the camera in front of him, calm and self-contained. The reporters were reminded forcibly of his son Ian, who always faced cameras with the same dignified reserve. First of all, all contracts between the Weston Group and A1 Logistics and any other companies managed by the Wright family are terminated with immediate effect. We will never cooperate with them again. Secondly, all our subsidiaries will follow the same edict. He smiled confidently. Thirdly, we will oppose any developments that A1 Logistics and its sister companies wish to make in this region. We will drive them out of this city with their tail between their legs. A storm of whispers spread through the assembled journalists. A well-established businessman like Edward would under any normal circumstances, no better than to make such charged statements. This sort of tactless declaration was sure to cause public outrage and would leave a stain on his reputation that he wouldn't be able to wash off. But he had just come out with it with no hesitation. The reporters barraged him with questions. Mr. Weston, are you planning to create a monopoly on business in this city? Mr. Weston, couldn't this be interpreted as rather petty? Aren't you afraid of the effect it's going to have on your holdings? We've had reports that your son's going to make a full recovery, so why are you still targeting the Wright family? It wasn't only the reporters who had unanswered questions. All the TV viewers were invested in finding out what was going on. A fight against the Westons and Wrights was a spectacle you didn't see every day. They were fighting over the market, and if they didn't want to make all their customers suffer, and therefore lose all their business they would have to absorb any losses themselves. One, if not both, of the two competing companies was going to take a big hit, possibly one they couldn't recover from. Edward didn't answer any of the questions. Stepping away from the microphone, he left surrounded by bodyguards. Daniel moved up to take his place before the reporters. The reporters, who had been all set to chase after Edward, stopped as Daniel took the stand. Suddenly, Daniel's face was full of microphones. Can you please explain Mr. Weston's statement? What's the reason behind the sudden boycott? Aren't you worried about the effect on your business when the reasons come to light? Daniel waited calmly until there was a lull in the questions. The reporters were being better behaved than usual, and they gave him space to speak. 
You want to know why we're doing this? He asked. Well, that's exactly what we want to tell you at this press conference. Firstly, I want to reassure all our company employees that we care about their livelihoods and would never do anything to jeopardize them. With just that one sentence, he had ensured the support of thousands of local people. Now, he could move on to the heart of the matter. I believe everyone knows that we have been at odds with the rights for some time. The present situation is merely a slight escalation of an existing feud. The reason is very simple. It is because the rights have offered the Westons a provocation we can't ignore. We have tried to turn the other cheek, but all that has done is make them take further advantage. Now, they've gone too far. In the wake of his powerful statement, silence reigned, all the journalists poised in readiness for his next words. Even though Jason Wright knows full well that my brother and Madison are a happily married couple with children, he will not stop disrupting their lives with his unwanted attention. He even proposed marriage to Madison, and falsely claimed that my unborn nephew is his child. Finally, he announced to the media that my brother is suffering from mental illness, which was no more than cheap revenge for the overthrow of his romantic plans. That is unacceptable. In light of this evidence of underhandedness on Jason Wright's part, we had cause to re-examine all the contracts between the Weston Group and A1 Logistics. When we did so, we discovered many hidden clauses that led to our decision to sever all business ties with A1 Logistics and all other companies managed by the duplicitous Wright family. Daniel's expression became even more serious. The Wrights even went so far as to send people into the Greenwald family home to harm my sister-in-law. If Ian hadn't been there to protect her, she might have died. Instead, it was Ian who was admitted to the hospital with serious injuries. How can our family sit back and do nothing after such provocation? Daniel rubbed his chin, catching on the light stubble that lent him a ruggish air. The Wrights are working on the assumption that because the Westons are a civilized and law-abiding family, there would be nothing we could do to retaliate. They expected us to honor the contracts and swallow our anger. They've used their unscrupulous business practices to bully other companies for years. But we're not just going to sit back and take those tactics. We've endured it for a long time, and now we're at the limit of our patience. They'll never gain an inch on us again. Now we plan to exert ourselves and regain all the ground we and other local companies have lost to them. Daniel raised a clenched fist in the air like a revolutionary general, and the cameras clicked and flashed. He stepped off the podium, adjusted his suit, and walked away. He left panic behind him, as all the reporters immediately got out their phones and called their headquarters. With a fight between the Westons and the Wrights on the cards, they would have their work cut out for them. Henry Wright threw his coffee mug at the TV screen. As it shattered, droplets of cold coffee dripped down the screen where the press conference had just finished showing. The TV fizzled, flickered, and then went black. That blasted family damn Edward, he shouted. Suddenly lightheaded, he fell back onto the couch and gasped for air. Scared that he was having a heart attack, he still managed to shout out the hated names of all his enemies in the Weston family between gas for air. Darren rushed over to him, peering anxiously down into his poo's face. Are you all right? He asked quietly. All we need right now is having Henry rushed into the hospital, he thought. Henry didn't answer, but just stared at the cracked TV with blank eyes, panting for breath. He was still sitting there ten minutes later when the first of the news vans arrived at the gate. Soon, the house was surrounded by the press. Everyone wanted the Wright's response to the Weston statement. The Westons had fired the first volley in the war, and the Wrights were starting at a disadvantage. Everything hung in the balance. But neither Henry nor Jason graced the reporters with an appearance. Jason was too busy planning how to get his hands on Ian's medical records so he could prove he hadn't been lying, and Henry was absorbed in plotting the final and irrevocable downfall of the entire Weston business empire. Liana was still sitting on her hospital bed at Mercy, eating an apple, when she saw the news. She froze with the fruit halfway to her mouth. The Westons have shown such extraordinary strength and courage all through this. What chance do the Wrights have against them? She wondered. The apple suddenly lost its flavor, 
and she threw it viciously into the bin. What am I supposed to do now? Her lawyer, Tim Percival, knocked perfunctorily on the door and walked in without waiting for her response. I've got Henry's secretary on the line for you, he declared. She took the phone suspiciously, and Darren said, Ah, there you are at last. Mr. Wright wants you to know that he's behind you all the way. He wants Madison sent to prison at any cost. You'll only be safe once she's behind bars. Once this matter's settled, he'll make sure you're compensated well and relocated somewhere far from here. He hung up. Liana was left gaping at the dead phone. He didn't even give me a chance to say if I agreed. I really have no choices left, do I? I alienated the Westons when I decided to frame Madison. The moment I opened my mouth and lied, I cut off all my escape routes. If it wasn't for the right support, God knows what they might have done to me already. I got into bed with the devil, so now I can't object when he asked me to blacken my soul for him, she thought. Tim pulled up the chair and laid files out all over the bed, then proceeded to lay out for her all the legal hoops that she would have to jump through for their case to progress to court. Eventually, he declared, Well, that was a good chat, and took his leave. Liana breathed a sigh of relief. Creeping to the door, she checked the corridor and found it empty. Pleased, she snuck off in the direction of Ian's room. It had been easy enough to find out where he was. She had worked there for over five years, after all. The hospital held no secrets from her. She had sneakily steered her nurse's conversations in the direction of the news she craved. Ian is seriously injured. I want to see his haggard face. I want to see him lying at the edge of death she thought as she slunk through the halls with a smile playing around her mouth. She rounded one last corner and halted with a frown. A bodyguard was standing outside his room. She hovered just out of sight, watching for an opportunity. It arrived in the form of a phone call. The guard turned away and moved off a few steps to take the call, so as not to disturb the patient he was guarding. Liana crept into the room behind his back. She found not one but two people in the room, both Ian and Madison were sleeping. Ian lay as still as a corpse, but Madison's sleep was restless and disturbed. Liana's eyes rested on Ian's pale face for a moment in satisfaction, and then she moved to the side of Madison's bed. Madison jolted awake and scrambled off the other side of the bed, facing her across the mattress. Liana? How dare you come here? Liana smiled and sat on the chair by Ian's bedside. Looking at him sleeping reminded her of how he had looked when he had been resting at the villa under her care. Her eyes softened. Why shouldn't I come here? I'm not a murderer. I'm not his mistress either. Shifting her focus to Madison, she thought, It's finally my time to take center stage. These two have been the stars of the show for too long, but now they'll have no choice but to watch me steal the spotlight. Words erupted from her in a boiling rage. You're now a suspect. How does that feel? No matter the outcome, you've already lost. So what if your lawyer comes up with clever arguments to get you off? You'll never be able to remarry Ian now, with this hanging over you. An unborn child that you use like a bargaining chip won't be enough to offset a charge of aggravated assault. Madison pursed her lips and regarded her silently. Liana leaned forward and stroked Ian's cheek. I want to see you and Ian begging me for mercy. Your reputation, your entire future is hanging on a single word from me. If you do what I want, I can stop any suspicion being cast your way. So what do you say? Are you ready to beg? And what about Ian? Oh, of course he can't beg me for anything, he's in a coma. When she smiled down at him, it was especially cold. You're crazy, Madison said. You were even willing to gamble with your child, so I know you're capable of anything. And all of that, just to make us beg? Have you ever even thought about the little life you were playing with? Even though I've been witness to her viciousness, it's still hard to believe, she thought. Crazy! Liana laughed wildly. Oh, Madison, you don't even know the half of it. I was forced to leave my home and come here. When I watched Ian pining after you for five years, coming up with more and more elaborate schemes to get him to notice me, I was already crazy. I'm way past that now. All the wildness suddenly drained out of her, and she affixed Madison with a sharp glare. Now kneel down and beg me for mercy. 
If you do well, I'll withdraw my testimony and give you a recording admitting my guilt. Madison squinted angrily at Liana. She was so full of anger that she was worried that her baby would be able to feel the turbulence, so she rubbed her belly comfortingly. I don't believe her. Would she damn herself just for the sake of hearing me beg? She wondered. Liana waited for Madison's decision, looking between her and the comatose form of Ian on the bed. Who would have thought that such a powerful man could fall so low and lie here weakened and at my mercy? She thought. She didn't notice that under the cover of the blankets, Ian's hands were slowly clenching into fists. Liana suddenly stood up and glared at the door. Did you deliberately get the bodyguard to move away to lure me in here? Do you want me to finish Ian off while he can't defend himself? She began to pull at her hair. No, no, I'm calm. I'm saying too much. Her eyes snapped up to Madison's. Are you recording this? Liana's face broke into a manic smile. I see how it is. This is all a trap. Madison woke up so quickly when I came in. She must have been faking sleep. Is Ian faking it too? No, that's impossible. I'm a surgeon. I know he couldn't have recovered so quickly from a head injury like that. But maybe they faked the whole thing to get a recording of me admitting what I did. That's it. It's all a trick. And she's recording me now. She concluded, her thoughts spiraling. Pulling frantically at her clothes as if searching for a recording device, she went to the door and looked out fearfully. You could call your guard back now. I'll never give you what you want. She cackled and ran out of the room. Madison let out a short laugh, half relief and half confusion. Liana's losing it now. Why did she think I was recording her? I don't think it would be admissible as evidence anyway. Not that I needed it, but even so, she thought. And as for intentionally letting her in here, that's just stupid. Why on earth would I allow the person who wants to kill us into our room when we're so vulnerable? We're just lucky that she was so out of it that she didn't take advantage. Maybe she's still on heavy painkillers for her injury. She's certainly not acting rationally. Since the Westons are so clearly winning this war with the rights, why would Liana choose to put herself on the line for them? She went over to Ian's bedside and checked on him. Seeing that he was still resting peacefully, undisturbed by Liana's visit, she sagged onto the chair beside him. Nevertheless, she couldn't shake the uneasy feeling that the encounter had left. She called Francis, who chastised the guard on the door, and ensured he wouldn't leave his post again. The news that Liana was accusing Madison of assault spread like wildfire. It had been a week since the supposed attack had taken place, and there had been no breakthroughs in the case yet. There were no witnesses to Madison stabbing Liana in the stomach, but there was damning evidence of the footage showing her holding the bloody knife in a trembling hand. On the day that Liana was released from the hospital, the entrance was crowded with reporters. Over the preceding week, their bylines had been full of the increasing disruption to retail caused by the disagreement between the Westons and the Wrights. The Wrights were feeling the economic pressure, and it seemed inevitable that they would eventually break. Many of the journalists speculated that the only reason that they had held out for so long was that the Westons were distracted by Ian's condition. Once he recovered, the Wrights would have no choice but to give up the fight. But the Wrights had found a way to fight back. When Liana stepped out of the doors of Mercy Hospital, Tim was by her side. His presence started a new storm of speculation since he was well known as a Wright family lawyer. The reporters bombarded her with questions. Liana, what is your relationship with the Wright family? Why are you pursuing this vendetta against Madison? Why are you being represented by a Wright family lawyer? What sort of deal have you cut with them? What sort of sentence are you hoping for in your court case? They all crowded forward, eager for her responses. But Liana put on a pair of sunglasses and held a hand up in front of her face like a celebrity having a bad hair day. Tim sheltered her and steered her toward the waiting car. Just a few words, please. Do you have a personal grudge against Madison? What do you think of Leo Dashing's attempt to get the charge reduced to assault? That's a lot less than the attempted murder charge you want to file. Since the maximum sentence for assault is much less, do you still intend to proceed? 
Liana had reached the car but paused with her hand on the door handle, her face tightening. She glared at Tim across the roof of the car and he avoided her gaze. I'd hoped she wouldn't find out about the change in the charge just yet. She's upset, but can't she see? The rights don't care how long Madison gets. They just want her in prison, even if it's only for a few days. As long as she's inside and out of the Weston sphere of influence, then they can spirit her away. I thought I'd have more time to get Liana on board with the idea, Tim thought. Having failed to receive any reassurance from her lawyer, Liana turned back to the reporters and took off her dark glasses. Her face was tense and angry. No matter how good Madison's lawyer is, the truth is the truth. She can't twist it at her will. My unborn baby lost its life because of her action. That's murder. And she posed a threat to my life as well. I don't know how her unscrupulous lawyers can justify their claims. That's between them and their conscience. But no matter what, I won't give up on justice. Cameras flashing, the reporters crowded around them, but she got into the car and drove away, leaving behind an atmosphere of tense expectation. Things were tense in the police station as well. Time was running out before the trial, and the evidence was still confusing and inconclusive. Ian's life was no longer in danger, but he hadn't woken up yet. The economic war between the Westons and the Wrights was causing chaos, and Liana was like a dog with a bone, determined to tear Madison apart. Javier and Kate were still being held awaiting trial. The police no longer needed to question them, but no one had come to post bail for either of them. Kate mooched around her cell like a lost child, lonely and fragile. John's words kept echoing around her head. Am I going to be the wife of a murderer? I just want a family, a couple of kids and a happy life. But once Javier is sentenced, that dream will go up in flames, she thought. Her thoughts were tormenting her so much that she felt feverish and slow. The door opened suddenly, and she leaped like a frightened gazelle. Martin stood framed in the doorway, looking roguish and handsome in his uniform. Her heart sped up. She was very frightened of the police. What now? What else can have gone wrong? I've been through so much in my life, but I've never been so alone, so cut off from any family that cares about me. She shuddered as she recalled the image of Ian covered in blood. It's the reason I'm so abandoned because of the pressure from the Westons. They must be the reason I'm still here. How much longer can they possibly keep me here? Have you been well, Miss Greenwald? Martin asked politely, knowing that her time behind bars had been long enough to make her miss the sight of the sky. Have you had time to think about your future? Do you have anything you want to say now? Kate wrapped her arms around her torso and blinked rapidly. What, what do I have to do to get out of here? She asked. Martin smiled, showing all his teeth. He strode further into the cell, appearing powerful and in control. You're joking, aren't you? It's only a matter of time before you're released. The only question is, how long you have to waste here first? Kate took a step closer to him and looked up at him imploringly. I want to leave now. He fixed her with a burning gaze, knowing he had her right where he wanted her. All right, now you just have to decide which version of Kate is going to walk out of this cell. Your first option is an accomplice to murder. After all, you smuggled Javier into the Greenwald family, as is evidenced by the security camera footage. He leaned against the doorframe and crossed his ankles, sticking one option off his fingers and raising a second finger. Secondly, you could be a witness. Javier cleverly tricked you, and you helped him entirely unwittingly. Thirdly, you could refuse to give any testimony in the case. In that case, the Greenwald family will kick you right back out onto the streets that you came from. It's entirely your choice. Kate listened in a daze, her eyes wide. Choices. None of these are any sort of choice at all, she thought with a frown. Martin shrugged as if her dilemma meant nothing to him and pushed off from the doorframe. Of course, if you feel threatened or forced into a decision, you can just leave now and see where you end up on your own. Take the help I'm offering or walk out and sue me. It makes no difference to me. I wish you luck. He gave her a cold look and walked away.
Kate looked at Martin's back as he left with a mixture of shock and fear. It seemed as if the same fate awaited her as Javier if she didn't change something. The Weston family didn't let anyone who hurt their family get off easily. After a moment of clenching her fists, Kate decided to follow Martin. I'll show him that he can't just come here and threaten me, she thought angrily. I'll destroy Madison if it's the last thing I do. All I need is for Liana to stick to her story. She passed a temporary holding cell and saw Javier inside. Kate! Kate! He called out to her anxiously as he crawled over to the bars. Save me! You have to help! The Weston family is crazy! They're saying that they'll keep me here for life and expect me to beg for mercy! You have to help! A strange buzzing sound went through the bars, surprising her enough that she jumped back. Is that Javier? She thought. I almost didn't recognize him. She could smell his strong, unwashed body odor. His hair was a tangled mess, and his clothes were filthy. Please save me! He cried desperately. The family is crazy. You have to help me. They're torturing me here. Look at me! Kate just stood staring at him for a long time in abject horror. The Weston family has gone crazy, she thought over and over. If they dare to abuse him in the police station, they are mad and powerful. They must think that Javier really won't get out. As long as he's here, no one will believe him. Kate was beginning to feel lucky that she had been locked in the house by her family and that she was Madison's sister. When she turned away from the holding cell, she saw Martin leaning against a wall observing her. Javier, he said slyly, you are lucky to have found such a good woman. Kate would stand beside you even if it meant being an accomplice to murder. I believe that when the case is settled, you'll be together again. Hopefully, you'll still love each other. Kate clenched her fist angrily but just stared at Javier silently. She didn't know what to feel, think, or say, and Javier just stared at her in a daze. Oh, Martin continued casually. I almost forgot that Liana was discharged from the hospital today. You cared about her too, didn't you, Javier? The child is gone, but she has connections in the right family now and will be taken better care of than you two. Then... Martin walked away without a second glance, despite Javier's desperate screams. How did I end up here? He despaired. If I hadn't joined forces with the right family, would I be here now? Even if I had stopped waiting for Kate, I probably would have had a better outcome. He was beginning to think that he would be better off dead than trapped in a jail cell being tortured endlessly. Kate is too weak and afraid to help me after Martin's threat, he realized. She probably wants to pretend like she never knew me. I'm truly on my own. Kate felt defeated as she walked through the rest of the jail. It seemed like everyone was out to get her. When she reached the office, Martin threw a document onto his desk. Sign it, and you can leave, he said sternly. Your driver is waiting for you. Her hand shook as she held the document without reading it. Is there another choice? She asked hesitantly. What choice would you like to make? He asked her questioningly. She thought for a long moment before saying, I'd like to take Javier with me away from the city. Let us go somewhere and build new lives. I won't hurt or go near Madison ever again, and I can also prove that the knife was Liana's. I saw her holding it. Do you think that taking Javier away would be an option? He asked scornfully. Javier nearly killed Ian. How dare you think that we would let him go? Aren't you afraid that the Weston family will hunt you down wherever you go? Kate turned pale and looked at him in shock. She hadn't realized how serious the situation was. I don't know how to make you understand that Javier is an addict with debts all over town, Martin said. He's never going to marry you and settle down. But you're so infatuated with him that you can't even see him for what he is. Did you think that he loved you? You're just a foolish girl that he was taking advantage of and you were the only person who didn't see it. I can't make that deal for you because Javier will never go free, and you'll never be able to repair the damage you've done. As for Liana, we can prove what you've told me some other way. She hesitated, unsure of what to do since she had played her best card. Sign it, and you can leave, Martin repeated without even looking at her. 
She just stood staring at the document for a long time without signing it. It didn't matter to her that everyone was becoming impatient. After some time, she threw the papers at Martin. I'm not an accomplice to murder. I was tricked, she declared. Javier made me believe that we could build a life together. I didn't know that he had fathered Liana's child or that he went to kill Madison and Ian. I didn't know anything. Everyone turned to look at her curiously, but Martin just grinned at her. Thank you for your cooperation, he said as he handed her another document to sign. As soon as she left, Martin called Daniel and said something that no one else could hear. Kate hid in her room for several days after she left the police station. No one in the family even reached out to check on her. She felt invisible and wondered what she had left worth living for. The news about her statement to the police shocked her. She had sworn that Liana's child wasn't Ian's. It was Javier, the man who had tried to kill Madison and Ian. The reporter went on to say that the new evidence of a DNA test on the fetus would help Ian's defamation case against Dr. Yardley. The news report seemed to be all positive turns of events for the Greenwald and Weston families. Kate didn't know what to think. She hadn't expected her statement to help Madison, but she also thought that Madison might be her only hope. When she finally emerged from her room, John spoke to her for the first time. You should be glad that Liana's child isn't Ian's and that we consider you family. Even though we're not poor, I can't protect you the way the Weston family can Madison. I'm going to send you to Australia, and you should think carefully before ever trying to return. He left the room without even looking at her, leaving her shocked. After some time to think it through, she sighed in relief that she wasn't going to go to jail. Madison was in the hospital when she saw the news. Martin had given her two statements about Liana's child to prepare her, but it still made her uncomfortable that Liana was publicly claiming that she was carrying Ian's child. Even though she believed Ian, not everyone did. She rubbed her belly and looked at Ian, who was still unconscious in the hospital bed. She sighed as a loud noise right outside her door caught her attention. You can't go in there, Mr. Wright, someone shouted. Mr. Wright, I'm serious. The Weston and Greenwald families won't allow it. The bodyguards were trying to stop Jason from entering the room, and Madison tried to focus on the news instead of what was happening in the hallway. You should all get out of my way. Jason yelled at them angrily. Do you think that I would force Ian from Madison's side in such a public space? Jason was furious that anyone would try to keep him from the woman he had risked everything for. Everything he did was for her, and he was about ready to explode in anger and frustration. After all that he had done to break Madison and Ian apart, he still hadn't been able to expose Ian's mental illness to the public. He couldn't even release his doctor's records without jeopardizing his own family's influence in the community. When the door opened, Madison turned to look at Jason with cold indifference. She didn't seem happy at all to see him there. What's wrong? she said. Why did you risk coming here? Jason just stood there shocked. He didn't know what to do. So Madison turned her attention back to the news. Even the bodyguard behind Jason didn't know what to make of the situation. It seems strange that such an eligible young bachelor would be so set on pursuing a woman that didn't want him. After some time, Jason closed the door and walked over to the side of the bed. Madison, he said breathily, I found irrefutable proof that Ian does have a mental illness. Is that so? She said unconcerned. Congratulations. He reached out and grabbed her hand desperately, but she didn't move. Her indifference broke his heart for the hundredth time. Are you sure that you should be giving me so much attention so publicly to a woman who is carrying another man's child? She asked as she rubbed her belly. He looked at her and felt the full truth of her rejection. It made him angry. Do you love me? She asked more as a challenge than a question. He just stood there staring at her while his anger grew and his heart broke. Do you love me? She repeated. Does she need any more proof? He thought. I provided her with the protection of my family name, and I've risked everything to be with her. Why does she think I'm here if it's not because of love? If you think about it, is this love? She continued. What am I supposed to do? In the past, I felt like you did like me. Maybe it was love. 
But since I've been back, it's felt as if you've turned me into someone I'm not. Some ideal that I can never really be. Neither of them seemed to notice Ian, who was frowning beside them. Before you became the heir, perhaps your love was real, she said. You had so many thoughts about me and acted on them. I remember you trying to figure out if something was going on between Ian and Allie while you were with Allie. For some reason, I did believe that you could truly love then. Jason thought about how all he had wanted then was for Madison to be happy, no matter what that looked like. Somewhere along the line that had changed. Your love has never felt as pure since then, Madison said softly. After I returned to the country, you had become the family heir and changed. I don't think you've truly loved anyone since. It all felt like a fight for an ending that you've dreamed up. Sometimes it seems that you've created this fantasy world that you're desperate to force into existence. It's not really about me anymore. No! Jason shouted. That's not it at all. I do love you. I've always loved you. Madison just stared at him as he trembled with emotion. Don't you know how much I love you? He continued. I was with Allie to protect your happiness. I've done everything I could to protect you all this time. I never thought of hurting you. Have I ever hurt you? You can't doubt how deeply I love you. Madison sat quietly for a long time before saying, Is that so? Then why are you here? Jason just ignored her question and took out the medical records he had come to show her as if they were the key to everything. He didn't think that Ian would be able to prove that the records were fake and save his reputation. To do that, Ian would have to submit to a public examination. This is Ian's medical record, Jason said as he handed it to her. You have to believe me that he can't keep you safe and happy. Can you trust me just this once? You need to leave him. You plan to hand this fake record to the press, she guessed. So I'm supposed to believe that you love me when you're willing to destroy my family? Jason was shocked and didn't know what he could say to her. It doesn't matter if it's real or fake. Once you release it, Ian will have to do a public examination. She continued. Is that your goal? Then I'll be forced to leave him and raise his child on my own. No, Jason hurried to deny it. You won't be alone because I'll be with you. I won't abandon you. Madison laughed before asking, Why do you think that you have a chance if I'm not with Ian? Do you think that I'll just run into your arms after you destroy the man I love? Even if he never gets out of this bed, I'll never leave him. He'll have to leave me. Jason began to shake as he realized how determined she was to live and even die with Ian. She stood up to face him and said, What are you going to do? Will you stop targeting him? Do you want me to beg? If it'll change your mind, I'll do it. He had never expected her to be willing to beg. She had always seemed like such a proud woman to him. If you beg me, I'll stop, he said. If you love him and are determined to raise this child with him, I'll let it go, he whispered sadly. He wasn't sure that she would do it, but he felt like a villain for even making her. Madison grabbed her belly with one hand and held onto the hospital bed with the other as she prepared to kneel on the ground. She thought about what exactly she could say to make Jason understand that she would never willingly be with him. But something stopped her from kneeling. She realized that it was the powerful, familiar grip of Ian and turned to look at him in disbelief. He was awake. I can't believe that he's finally awake, she thought excitedly forgetting about everything else for a moment. The doctors were sure that Ian would survive after the surgery, but they couldn't tell Madison when he might wake up. It had been several days, and she'd begun to worry that he wouldn't wake up. Madison, he said softly. Madison's eyes filled with tears as she looked at him with so much love in her eyes. The way he said her name was the most beautiful sound she had ever heard. He made her the happiest woman in the entire world. Him, not his money or fame. Ian smiled at her and said, Have you checked in with your doctor? Madison laughed and remembered that Ian had promised to go to every appointment with her before he had been stabbed. She seemed to completely forget that Jason was in the room with them. 
No, she said. Not without you. Jason watched Madison interact with Ian, but he was still processing the fact that Madison had been about to kneel in front of him and beg. He reached out to grab her hand and gestured for her to sit down once he had her attention. Ian looked up at him angrily. He wouldn't forget the things that Jason had tried to force Madison to do, and his anger grew as he thought about Madison preparing to kneel and beg. That was why Ian had woken up. He didn't want Madison to have to beg for anything, and he wanted to protect her. She shouldn't have to lower herself for such an immature man. Since you have proof, release it to the public. Ian dared him. I wasn't awake when you first came in, but I am now. I'll make you pay for treating my wife so horribly. Jason was shocked and angry that Ian was able to claim so easily everything that he wanted. It didn't seem to matter what he tried. Madison didn't return his affection. It was all he could do not to step forward and start a fight with Ian. Jason? Ian snarled. You should proceed with caution, or I'll have you escorted out. Francis came into the room and saw Ian and Madison sitting on the bed and looking at each other, while Jason stood off to the side brimming with anger. He turned around and went to find the doctor before anyone saw him. The next morning, every news channel was reporting about Ian, Madison, and Liana. There seemed to be some sort of competition over Madison happening between the Weston and Wright families. Some even reported that Ian had finally woken up and wasn't in serious condition any longer. The reasons why Javier stabbed Ian were still being investigated according to the local law enforcement agencies. Liana's lies about carrying Ian's child and the relationship between them had been proven false and the Weston family had taken legal action against her. Some reporters were wondering if Madison had stabbed Liana since there didn't seem to be any reason for her to attack the other woman so viciously. If she had stabbed Liana, what had driven her to do so? Even Kate had questioned how or why Madison had ended up with Liana's knife. Madison had been holding her belly seconds before Liana was injured. If that was the case, and the clothes she had been wearing didn't have any pockets... What had happened? The reports started another chaotic battle on social media about what had occurred. Some thought that Liana might have been crazy enough to stab herself. Others questioned whether Kate was telling the truth. Surely she would try to protect her family's reputation. When Ian was released from the hospital, he went back to the Greenwald residence with Madison. He said that he wanted to recover there with her. Kate turned pale when she realized that Martin hadn't been exaggerating the seriousness of Ian's injuries. Javier had been trying to kill him. Francis helped Ian get upstairs to Madison's room before leaving. Zach stood in the doorway watching him for a moment. Don't you have your place to be? Zach asked disdainfully. Why are you lowering yourself to stay here? Ian just ignored him and lowered himself onto Madison's bed. He was just happy to be where Madison was. If you're so worried about my reputation, Ian said, why don't you and the rest of the family go somewhere else while I rest? That made Zack furious. How could such a rich man possibly need to take anything from him? Zack raised his eyebrows questioningly before going downstairs to talk to Madison. He kept her occupied for two hours instead of letting her join Ian in her room. Madison had no idea what Zack was up to and she thought that Ian was asleep. Meanwhile, Ian got more annoyed the longer he waited for her to join him in her room. When he went into the hallway, Zack gave him a smug, satisfied grin that made him furious. Zack's smile grew bigger as he thought about how angry he had been able to make Ian. After that first evening, most of the Greenwald family left Ian in peace. Kate didn't dare to approach him, and she even lowered her eyes any time she happened to be close. Rumors were flying around the internet, though, as people tried to figure out exactly what had happened. Some talked about how conniving Liana was, and guessed that Madison had been framed. More and more began to turn on Liana. Others posted how they hoped that Ian would recover soon and come to Madison's aid. When Madison began to pay attention to the news again, more information about Liana's past was beginning to surface. There were reports of her youth in Bend, and her dreams to marry a wealthy man. The reporters painted her as a heartless woman who would stop at nothing to get what she wanted. She had come to Portland to start fresh 
and had happened to find employment as Ian's assistant. Liana was a wreck when she saw the way that the news reports were beginning to turn against her. How could this be? She asked her lawyer. Didn't the Wright family say that they would take care of it? They promised that my past would never be uncovered. What is this? Her lawyer didn't know how to respond, or why the Wright family hadn't been able to bury her past. Before he could figure out what to say, his phone began ringing. Behind him, Liana lost her cool and began shouting and throwing things across the room. Madison! Ian! She screamed, I hate you both! When Liana thought back over her life, the time she had spent with Javier held her darkest moments. She had been so desperate to marry into a wealthy family that she had framed her classmates and acted completely differently around Javier's family, and they had been very adamant about their dislike of her. Eventually, Javier seemed to become bored with her and used Kate to hurt her feelings and chase her away. She had fled to Portland to start over. Around the same time, the Gomez family had begun to lose its influence and fortune. As she watched the latest news that favored Madison, Liana tried to call the rights, but no one answered. She had been abandoned, which was even more apparent when she went to find the lawyer and saw only empty hallways. Without the rights' support, she was sure the Weston family would destroy her. She frantically called every number connected with the family that she had, but no one answered. When her phone ran out of battery, Liana slumped down dejectedly on the ground. She spent a long time processing what had happened and hoping that she was wrong before getting up and packing her bags. Every noise outside the window made her jump because she was terrified that someone from the Weston family would show up before she could get away. She put on a hat and pulled it down to cover her eyes before sneaking out of her room. When she was almost to the door, Ron stepped in front of her, blocking her exit. Ron? She said hesitantly. She tried her best to calm her nerves. After all, it was only Ron, and had at least cared for her once. She could only hope that he still did and would let her go. It's so late, she said. Did you come to check on me? That's very kind of you. Ron just stepped closer to her without saying anything. My body has healed well, she said. There's no need to worry about me anymore, but I'm touched by your concern. He just looked at her quietly and didn't step out of the way, but she was beginning to feel guilty. Why aren't you saying anything? She asked. Have you been sad or angry? Do you want to talk? Finally, he sneered at her and said, It is late. Where were you going? She forgot to smile for a moment and stared at him with a blank expression. This news cycle just seems never-ending here in the city, she said after a long moment of silence. I thought I might go somewhere where my face wasn't plastered all over the TV and relax for a little while. Perhaps a change of scenery would do me good. I'm still sad about losing the child. Just yesterday, you seemed very anxious to talk to any reporter who would listen, saying how determined you were to see Madison in jail. So what changed to make you so anxious to get away? It's odd. Madison can't leave the city. And, as someone else involved in this whole ordeal, I'm not sure you should either. He said harshly. I think you should stay here. He continued as he remained in the doorway, blocking her path to freedom. Liana began to panic when he didn't move. She dropped the bag she was carrying and reached out to grab his arm desperately. Ron, can't you let me go? She said sweetly. The Wrights have abandoned me and the Westons want to destroy me. They'll never forgive me. Please, just let me leave. She cried so hard that her shirt was beginning to look as if she had been in the rain. Then she stepped closer to Ron. I beg you, she pleaded. Please let me go. I don't want to stay here any longer. I need to get away. Ron looked at her coldly and yanked his arms out of her hand. Do you think that you haven't even tried my limits? He sneered. I never thought that you would do half of the things you've done, but I was so wrong. You're even crueler than I ever imagined you could be. As long as everyone believed that Madison was the villain, I bet you thought that you would get away with your little scheme. It looks like as soon as that changed, you were ready to run. He added. Go back inside, he ordered. I'll stay here to make sure you don't leave before the court decides everything. There'll be no chance for you to run away from all the pain you've caused. 
Realizing that Ron didn't love her at all anymore made her very anxious. Ron, she pleaded as she latched onto him again. Don't be like this. Didn't you love me once? Can't you help me? Let me leave and I promise I'll never return. I'll never be a problem for you or Madison again. Or you can leave with me. We can start a life together somewhere where no one knows us. He impatiently pushed her away from him, forcefully expressing his irritation for the first time. Love you, he snarled. I did once, but no love can survive as many lies as you've told. From the moment you framed Madison, I had nothing but disgust for you. Then he turned around and called Paul. Hello, Paul, he said. Can you come over here? You were right. Liana fainted when she heard those words and didn't come back to her senses until Paul and a group of his men arrived. Paul looked at her distastefully before the bodyguards lifted her off of the ground and dragged her back to her room. Let go of me, she screamed. Let go of me or you'll regret it. I'll talk to the media about Ian's mental illness. I'll let everyone know about it if you don't let go of me. Paul frowned, but Ron just grinned at her coldly and said, Whom do you expect to believe you? Then, he and Paul left her in the care of the bodyguards. Liana began contacting reporters the next morning. Many of them complained about her past behavior, and others just refused to come altogether. Most felt as if her time in the spotlight had been played out, and they didn't want to miss the next big story. She didn't give up, though, and kept trying. The Weston family might be able to hold her prisoner, but they couldn't keep her from talking. She was determined to tell everyone who would listen about Ian's illness. Reports began circulating that Liana had admitted to reporters that Ian Weston was suffering from severe paranoia and that it was a very serious condition. She even claimed that Ian had endangered Madison and chosen to divorce her because he was afraid of hurting her. Although Liana didn't provide any real evidence, she told them about all the treatments he had tried and about his villa in Mount Tabor. The reports came with a warning at the end that the news outlets hadn't been able to verify the information yet, showing a lack of trust in her as a source. Jason Wright reported the same thing, giving her story a bit more credit to the public and creating a huge media storm. Several people started speculating about the matter and trying to guess whether Ian was mentally ill. More and more reporters urged Liana and Jason to produce evidence. When Madison saw the news, she was furious. Jason and Liana just didn't seem to know when to let things go. Ian had almost completely moved into the Greenwald residence, so at least he wasn't holed up at the villa trying to avoid the reporters that had swarmed there. He reached out and touched her gently when he saw how tense she was. What are you thinking? He asked as he wrapped his arms around her and pulled her close. She just looked at him tenderly and thought about how all the media might affect his recovery.